Okay, so um, this is one where we are going to ask you about experimental uh, procedures. So first of all, for a label diagram to show how you would safely set up this apparatus, app, apparatus to um, uh, distill off uh, the um, cyclohexanone and water. Okay, so we've got a round bottle flask, heat source, um, so you'd probably use a heating mantle uh, for that one. Um, thermometer bulb uh, at the level where the vapour comes over, um, then it's going to drip down into the receiving flask there, water in at the bottom of the reflux condenser and water out at the top, so it goes against gravity. Um, once you've collected this, it tells you it is um, uh, um, a mixture of both water and cyclohexanone um, that you have. Um, therefore, you would put it in a separating funnel um, and then you would uh, use the separated funnel to separate those two immiscible layers uh, together. Then you would add to the cyclohexanone a small amount, well, you'd add some magnesium sulfate, and hydrous magnesium sulfate, which would then remove all the water from that and filter off the magnesium sulfate and you're left with pure cyclohexanone, hopefully. Um, and then uh, once you've done that, you would redistill the organic layer um, and collect the fraction distilling at the boiling point of cyclohexanone, which is 156 degrees C. Uh, right, okay, so um, ethane thioric acid removes excess dichromine as glucose below. How would you tell when the excess dichromate is reacted completely? Well, um, it would stop fizzing because one of the products is carbon dioxide gas. So while this reaction is happening, you will see bubbles appearing. Once it's finished, no more carbon dioxide gas, no more bubbles. Um, student monitors, of course, the reaction using TLC. How could we use TLC to monitor the reaction? Uh, well, you would keep taking regular samples um, from the mixture. Um, you'd put a spot on a TLC plate um, alongside cyclohexanol um, uh, and um, cyclohexanone um, controls so you, you can see exactly when one's gone and the other one's appeared. So you've got your spot of your reaction mixture like so, then cyclohexanone, uh, cyclohexanol, um, then you run um, the TLC and you can see which one you've got. So uh, you can see that the reaction is complete uh, when it's all but converted into cyclohexanol. Um, and then finally, plan experiment which allow the student to confirm the identity of the pure organic product. This is where you'd use 2,4-dinitrophenol um, uh, uh, hydrazine. Um, you would get an orange precipitate which you would recrystallize and then you would measure its melting point and then compare that melting point against known values um, in, a, in a data book um, to make sure that you have uh, prepared cyclohexanone. Right, so there's a lot of information for question 21. Um, so let's just work our way through. Uh, the first bit we're going to use is that uh, it's told me I've got an empirical formula of C3H6O. If you add all that up, that comes to 58. You notice the molecular line is actually double that, 116. And therefore the molecular formula must be double that, C3H12O2. Now I'm going to skip across to the carbon-13 NMR now. Um, if you have a look at this, I have got one, two, three, four, five peaks. So I've got five carbon environments. But let's have a look. At this one, I've got C double bond O. So I have got a carbonyl in there, um, so that's quite important. The rest isn't really that important um, in terms of the chemical shifts, but it is telling me I've got C double bond O because I've got a peak at around about uh, 213 ppm. Okay, now remembering, I know I've got a carbonyl group in my carbon-13 NMR. This could be a carboxylic acid in theory, or it could be an aldehyde, or it could be a ketone. So let's have a look at my hydrogen NMR. 
can you see this stops at four? So I've not got an OH there, and I haven't got a C double bond H group there, because that's shifted well down. And therefore, I know I must have a ketone group in there. So I know I've got this group, and it's a ketone. Right, let's just compare these two now. You'll notice that I've got a peak here, which disappears when I run it in B2O. This peak, would there be an O, is therefore an OH group, um, because uh, uh, it disappears when I put it in um, B2O solution. And therefore I also know my molecule, I've got an alcohol group. Right, so then we need to look at um, our hydrogen NMR, which isn't run in D2O in a little bit more detail. So you notice I've got a peak here, which uh, is due to six hydrogens, and it's split into a doubler. So um, it means I've got two CH3, two CH3 groups, but they must be next to a hydrogen. So I must have CH3, CH, CH3 in the molecule. So this is, those two are given the peak, and then it's that hydrogen that's splitting them. If I look at this peak here, which relates to it, this is only one hydrogen, so it's going to be that hydrogen there. It's split into seven peaks because it's next to six hydrogens. And from looking at the shift, it's C double bond O, C, H there. Okay, on the other side of this C double bond O, I must have a CH2, CH2 group here. This is two hydrogens. I've got a CH2 group there, but it's split into a tripler, and therefore it must be next to another CH2 group here, which is going to be that one. But from the shift, that is attached to an oxygen atom, which is that one there. So let's put this together. If I put OH, that's my alcohol, and then I know I've got CH2, I'm then going to have this CH2, but that CH2 is connected to C double bond O, and then that C double bond O is CH, and then CH3, CH3, like so. Go back to our carbon um, NMR. Our carbon NMR said that I had um, five peaks, and I've got one, two, three, four, five carbon environments, and therefore it looks like that's the correct structure.